Hi, everybody. Shavua Tov. Uh, it is Eve Harrow on Rejuvenation for the Land of Israel Network. Today, May 19th, 2019, the 14th day of the year, 57. 79. And uh, before I start my interview today, I'm sitting with Robbie Berman in his apartment in Jerusalem on a really, really beautiful day. Just want to thank Ben and Tabitha for helping me uh, put out this podcast and for helping all of us and all their hard work. And remind you guys that in just a couple weeks on Shavuot at the Mount Zion Hotel, Land of Israel Network is going to be having a really great long weekend. A lot of learning, a lot of Torah learning, walking tours. I am going to be there. I'm confirmed. I'm going to be there on Sunday. I will be there for lunch. Um, host, I'm one of the hostesses for the lunch, but I will also be giving a class before that and a walking tour later on in the day. And I'll also, it looks like, be guiding on Monday, at least the early part of the trip um, that's going out to the farm, but I will be taking people to Herodian and to stay bar on the way to the farm. So I hope that I see some of you on Shavuot. And of course, you can look on my website for more information. And of course, get it through the Land of Israel Network. Anyhow, so on to not such a light subject, um, something that many people are, I guess, would even, I would say, are uncomfortable talking about. But as a lot of you know, that's what I do on this show, is get us all out of our uh, out of our comfort zones and really deal with issues that some of us would rather not talk about, but have to be dealt with because they're totally out there. So Robbie Berman, who I'm so glad uh, had made the time to join me today. He, as he'll tell you all, is about to leave for the States for a month, uh, having to do with this topic. And of course the topic is uh, organ donations and, um, and the great need and a lot of the issues about that. So Robbie, thanks so much for joining me today on the Land of Israel Network. You're welcome. Thank you very much for coming. So a little bit about, I mean, how you got involved with this. Did you get it, give it an organ? Did you have to get one? Did a family member pass away because they didn't have one? Like, you know, what's your personal involvement with this? So I started the organization, the Halachic Organ Donor Society, about uh, 18 years ago. And I started it because uh, I had noticed that Israel was not allowed to join the European Union for Organ Sharing. And when I asked them why, they said it's because Israel, Israel has a very low organ donor registration rate. They had, at that time, 3% of the population had signed organ donor cards. And in Spain, it was like 70%. So why would they let Israel join a network where all they would do would, would be to benefit from it, but never to actually to contribute because they didn't have enough, high enough numbers? So I asked around in Israel, why is it that people don't have organ donor cards? And everyone told me the same thing. Because religion, Judaism, doesn't allow for it. Which made absolutely no sense because the majority of Jews in Israel are secular Jews. So I live in the Greek colony, and right down the block there was a non-kosher, I think it was a McDonald's, and I went with my pen and paper. I was a journalist. I wanted to write an article about this phenomena, and I waited for someone to come out. It was a big, burly Israeli guy. He was not religious, clearly. He was not wearing a skull cap. He was wearing a tank top. He had a tattoo on his left shoulder. Uh, he was eating a big, whopping cheeseburger. Clearly, the guy is not, you know, so uh, he's not observant. So I said to the guy, do you have an organ donor card from Israel Transplant? And he said, chas v'shalom, God forbid, it's forbidden by Jewish law to have an organ donor card. I said, dude, you, you're eating a cheeseburger, you have a tattoo, those are forbidden in the Torah, in the Bible. Uh, how, you know, he said, I, I said, clearly you don't observe the commandments. He said, well, when it comes to my life, I don't want the Torah to inhibit my lifestyle, but when it comes to death, I want to be a little bit more religious. So you just mentioned something that my listeners already know is a theme here. A, that in Israel, though, there's no, we really can't say secular and religious or observant and non, because it's a whole spectrum here. And this is a very Israeli Jewish thing, which is that when it comes to the major life issues, marriage, death, divorce, giving your son, the, you know, circumcising your son, even Israelis who look like they're not observant or aren't observant, right? Like the guy that you just described are very based in tradition and very based in even, well, it would be end up being Jewish halacha, even if they wouldn't necessarily say that that's what they're doing. So this is a very interesting phenomena that you're talking about. Um, so, but what, what's the problem then? What is the halacha problem about not giving an organ? So uh, there are, uh, and that, that, that's a simple question, but the answer is a little bit more complicated. There are reasons that the uh, masses have that are not based on rationality, that are not based on Jewish law. It's based on misperceptions, which we'll, which we'll talk about. And then there's a legitimate reason which uh, people who are in the know uh, have an issue with, and that is, and we'll deal with that one first, that is the brain death issue. That there are uh, many rabbis who believe that a person whose brain is dead and the heart's still beating 
even though it's being beating artificially, meaning it's been getting oxygen artificially from a ventilator, and it will stop beating in a few days to a few weeks, maybe a few months, uh, but no one's ever woken up from brain death. But there are some rabbis who think that a brain-dead body, human body with a beating heart, is alive. And therefore, they won't let you donate that person's organs, because if you do, you're killing that person. Other rabbis, such as Rav Moshe Feinstein, Rav Avadi Yosef, the chief rabbi of Israel, Rosam Mechamek Goldberg, they all believe, no, a heart is just a pump. It's not even a very particularly smart pump. You can take that pump out of a human body, put it in a bucket of salt water, and the heart will beat for another half hour, not knowing it's left the human body. You can transplant a heart into someone else's body and never connect it to the brain, and it beats on its own for another 30, 40 years. Um, So those rabbis think that a beating heart is not a sign of human life, and once the person's unconscious, the brain is dead, they can't breathe of their own accord, and the only reason why the heart's beating is because they're on a machine that's helping it breathe, that's helping it beat by giving it oxygen, then you're dead for all intents and purposes. You're what's called a beating heart cadaver, and you should bury that person. So that's the brain death controversy, and that's a legitimate one. There are rabbis on both sides of the debate. You should know a couple of things. No one's ever woken up from brain death. The heart usually stops beating upon the onset of brain death when the heart's still beating uh, as a result of a ventilator. The heart stops beating in a few days usually. Um, and you have a lot of stories of people say, claiming they woke up from brain death, but uh, it's all nonsense because you never have the doctors go on television with them. It's like the patient, they come on, they don't. It's, there's not one documented case of a person waking up. Uh, so that's the brain death controversy. Um, the the other. Wait, so let me ask. So yeah. what? So what is the controversy? I mean, if you're saying that the heart will just stop beating on its own soon after brain death, so then no, make all the rabbis right. happy. No, no. And just wait till the uh, brain is dead and the heart stops beating, and then harvest the organ. Great question. The problem is, is that once the heart stops beating, uh, it stops uh, distributing blood with oxygen in it, and all the organs now suffer from oxygen deprivation. So you can't recover any organs. The, the perfect time to recover organs is when. The organism is dead, but the organs are still alive. Right. So the heart's still beating to keep the organs alive, not necessarily yeah, the person. In order to keep the heart. Yeah. People say, well, if a person never wakes from brain death, why do they put them on a ventilator? They don't. That's a misnomer. They never put it. If you came to the hospital brain dead, that means your brain died. You couldn't breathe. You didn't get oxygen. Your heart stopped beating two minutes later. That's never the case. What is the case is a person comes to the hospital. They're unconscious. They're having trouble breathing. They put them on a vent to help them breathe 20, 30, 40, 50%, 60%. While they're in the hospital, on that ventilator, unconscious, their brain then dies. And now the ventilator kicks in, takes over 100% of the breathing, and accidentally, incidentally, your heart still gets the oxygen and supplies oxygen to all of the other organs. And now your organs are alive, but your, your brain is dead. So in this specific case, that's where the issues come in with the rabbis and do you harvest right, do you brain, harvest the brain, the brain death controversy, right, right, right. The problem is, is that although I do respect rabbis who say that brain death with a beating heart is not death. I don't agree with that, but I respect people that have different opinions. What I have a, a, a morally uh, a moral issue with is those rabbis that say that uh, you know a Jew can't donate organs when they're brain dead with a beating heart because they're alive. But if a Jew ever gets sick and needs an organ, it's okay to take them from other people. Who would those other people be? Non-Jews. And that's morally a problematic stance. You have to have the courage to stand by your conviction that if you think a brain-dead person is alive, then don't donate your organs, but don't take them either. Mm-hmm. And that's the problem I have with people who take that, that path. You know, this is a very extreme case that I'm just remembering of someone um, that we knew from Los Angeles whose son, I believe, needed a lung and yes. did not, Power. they could, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, he needed a lung transplant, um, I'm a young boy, uh, and he didn't he didn't get it, and he died. And he could have the parents didn't because the rabbi told them they they could have saved him no, if I don't no, remember. No. no, see that's another problem. There, yeah. See, people hear so many stories, right. and they spread the stories as, as if it's true. People even read articles that I wrote or that I was quoted in. And then they repeat it to me, and they just didn't get the article. They didn't understand it. They didn't remember properly. Well, so you and I are both in the world of journalism. That's it's, one of the problems. It's incredible. Yes. It's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. It's unbelievable. So I wrote, I wrote an article criticizing the chief rabbinate of England about 10, 15 years ago under the leadership of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, where he said Jews can't donate organs because when they're brain dead, they're really alive. But if they ever need organs, it's okay to take them from other people. So I criticized him. 
And people call me up and they say, why are you criticizing the rabbi? He's all for organ donation. I said, no, you didn't listen to the article. He's not. He's not. He's for living donation for Jews when they're alive to donate a kidney, but he's not for cadaveric donation. And they just they just missed out on a nuance. But it's a significant nuance. Has he changed his mind or Rabbi no. Sachs is still holding no. there? I've had people approach him since he's left the chief rabbinate. He still hasn't changed his mind. And I find that he was criticized by rabbis and doctors around the world. What about other religions? I mean, here in Israel, you have a significant Muslim population and also not a small Christian population in addition to Druze and some of uh, you know, other, other religions. Is this, I know you're yeah. focused on halakha and on the Jewish part, but do you have contact with other religions? Yes. Um, well, I, I was recently interviewed on, Al- on Al-Hora television. It's a uh, satellite Arabic television network, and I was interviewed in Arabic to talk about the similarities of Sharia and Halakha on this issue. In Sharia, Arabic, Muslim, Islamic law, there's also a debate about brain death, whether or not brain death is death or not, and they have a similar type of debate about it. Um, I'm more of an expert, expert in Halakha and Jewish law. That's why I lecture about the topic. I'm, I'm an expert just on this particular issue. I'm not an expert on other issues. This is my only issue that I'm an expert on. Um, but uh, but what I didn't get to was that the other issues that Jews have, uh, and even non-Jews, with donating organs, and that is there are three biblical prohibitions in the Bible. There are 613 biblical commandments. Some are positive, some are negative, meaning thou shalt and thou shouldn't. And there are three uh, negative prohibitions in the Bible. It's called the Doraita, um, which says that you can't do three things with a corpse. And one of them is you cannot get benefit from a corpse, you cannot delay the burial of a corpse, um, and you can uh, not destroy or desecrate a corpse. Mm -hmm. Uh, When you donate an organ, it would seem to be you're cutting into and destroying part of a corpse. Um, You are also um, uh, getting benefit from a corpse, and you're also delaying the burial by a few hours at least. Mm. So all three. All three. And people say, so how can I donate organs if you're violating three biblical commandments? And the answer is very simple. There's also a commandment in the Torah not to eat pork. But you're allowed to eat pork. It's a mitzvah to eat pork if it can save your life. Mm-hmm. Because we know pikuach nefesh, saving a life, overrides almost every single commandment in the Torah. So why do you understand that by eating pork, but you don't understand that by donating organs? I once met a man uh, in Brooklyn who said that he would never eat pork. I said, what if your life depended on it? You were on a desert island, you were starving to death, you came across a vending machine, uh, it was solar panel, so, you know, just for consistency's sake. You were stranded with exact change and had pork sandwich. What do you think would you eat? He said, I would never eat pork. I'd rather die than eat pork. Well, I said, well, you know, you're, you're, there seems to me you're a very religious man, but what religion you are, I'm not sure, because it's not Judaism. That's not Jewish law. Jewish law is you do almost anything in order to save a life. When the Torah was written, could they have envisaged a time where you would have donor, you know, great, organs? Great point. Awesome point. And that's what, because people say to me, why do I think this was, uh, why do I think this has become a taboo and not other things? And that's because exactly, for thousands of years, people could envision I would need to eat non-kosher to save a life. I might have to travel on the Sabbath to save a life. I might have to light a candle, light a fire to save a life. But no one could ever imagine that I would take a knife and cut up a dead body to save a life. And that's why I think that that took on the taboo. I'm I'm, I'm very happy that you uh, came up with that because people often ask me that. And that's my response to them. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's why Judaism is supposed to be rolling with the times. And rabbis are, you know, you didn't also didn't have electricity in the time right. of the Bible. So how come there's a prohibition against turning on lights and Shabbat? Right. Because when electricity became an issue, the rabbis had to sit down and say, is this burning? Is this making a fire? Is it not? And there's so many things right now that are happening as the world is so fast paced that the rabbis are really, and you know, some are and some aren't right. keeping pace. The, the more modern organization, Sohar, the modern Orthodox rabbis, where do they sit on this they're with all you? For, they're for, they're for organization. Uh, when I started the organization 18 years ago, there were only uh, two rabbis in Israel that had organ donor cards, and only 3% of the population had organ donor cards. 120 Israelis were dying every year. I signed up about 350 rabbis to get the ID card, the Israeli organ donor card. Um, that had a trickle-down effect, and now 16% of society in Israel have organ donor cards. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And now uh, only 80 Israelis die every year on the list waiting for, for organs. 80 is still too much, but it's better than 120. Are we part of the European? Uh, no, no, I think we have to get up to like 35% or 40% to get in there. So we're still suffering from that. Um, New York, uh, New York Times had an article a few months ago that said that New York State has the lowest organ donor registration rate out of all 50 states. And when they turned in the article, they turned to the federal government agency in New York State and said, why? 
why does New York State have the lowest organ donor registration rate? And they said two words, Jews and Chinese. They, the largest population of Jews and Chinese in America live in New York, and they tend not to donate for whatever their reasons are. Mm -hmm. So what are some other reasons that yeah. Jews don't donate and other people don't donate? Well, first of all, Jews can be very superstitious, and they, don't, they believe in the evil eye, the ayin hara, and they don't want to sign an organ donor card that says that if... Yeah. I die, I want to donate my organs because they feel somehow by signing this, this document, this negative, really negative, conditional document, that if this happens, this horrible thing happens to me, I'll donate my organs. They feel somehow that they will be, um, I don't know what to, word to use, but they're going to bring it upon themselves. So okay, I assume they also don't buy life insurance then. Yeah, so that's my response to them. I said, you know, deep down, you don't really believe in the evil eye because if you did, you wouldn't buy health insurance, car insurance, fire insurance, death insurance, flood insurance, flight insurance. Every insurance policy says if this horrible thing happens to my family, they're going to get money, etc. Not only that, if you were, uh, if you really believe in the evil eye, no one when they got married would sign a ketubah. A ketubah, most people think, is a marriage document in Jewish law. It's not. It's actually a divorce document. Not only do we sign it, but we draw beautiful illustrations, we frame it, we put it on the wall, and the newlyweds, when they have guests over, they say, oh, look at our beautiful divorce document. If, this, if we get divorced and this horrible thing happens, look, you know, look what's going to, look what's going to be. So uh, if people don't really believe in it, it seems, I hate to be cynical, but that's one of my personality flaws if you put a document in front of someone's face and say hey sign this horrible document and if, if this horrible thing happens your kids will inherit a million dollars or you will get a million dollars everyone signs it but put a document in front of their face and say hey sign this horrible document and if it happens you will get no benefit from it your children will get no benefit from it and you will save the lives of eight strangers who you don't know so that's one of the issues that's going on here so that's the evil eye uh, there's another superstitious belief and that is there are many people Many Jews, Orthodox Jews, believe in a resurrection of the dead. Uh, now, I happen to know that I will not be resurrected from the dead, even if there is a resurrection, because the Rambam, Maimonides, says uh, that I won't be resurrected. He doesn't mention me by name, <laughs> but he says uh, only righteous people will be resurrected. And I've seen my CV, my resume, and I know for a fact I'm not a righteous person, so I will not be resurrected. But for those of you who are concerned that you need your organs for resurrection, I want you to think about fully what your belief says. This is what your belief says. You believe that you need to be buried with all of your organs in order to enable God to resurrect you. That's a very problematic statement. First of all, there's no source for that statement anywhere in classical Jewish literature. Number two, it's theologically problematic to say that God can't do something. If God wants to do something, he can do it. I mean, Hitler, I think, cremated about a million out of the six million. You mean to say God wants to, he wants to resurrect a million Jews, but he can't because Hitler won the game, because Hitler cremated them, and now he's really pulled a fast one over God? I mean, none of that makes sense. And three... Most significantly, your organs disintegrate in the ground, right? You don't have, they all decay. You don't have your organs for resurrection. So for those people who think that they need your organs for resurrection, that is a superstitious belief. There's no source for that anywhere in classical Jewish literature. No one says you need to be buried with your organs in order to enable God to resurrect you. Uh, there's another one, you know, most people, they go, they watch a lot of TV, and they hear this famous phrase. It's, you know, the priest or the rabbi says at the graveside funeral, from dust you came, and from dust you shall return. Um, and people think, oh, look, we came from the ground, we got to go back to the ground whole. Uh, you know, I happen to have learned about sex in fifth grade, and I found out my parents didn't make me from dirt. They had a much more interesting way to make me. Uh, most people weren't made from dirt. Who was made from dirt in the Bible? Adam. Adam was made from dirt. That's God telling Adam that he's going to die in a very literary way. Because you sinned in the Garden of Eden, you will now return to be an inanimate object. You came from dirt, you will go back to being dirt. But nowhere, nowhere in classical Jewish literature does anyone write that down as one of the 613 commandments, that you must be buried in the ground. It's not a commandment anywhere. In fact, that story says a lot of other interesting things that no one counts as a commandment. It says that because Adam sinned, not only will he die, but now he has to work by the sweat of his brow. Have you ever heard a graduate of Yeshiva University say, I really want to be an investment banker or a lawyer, but you know what? We don't sweat enough, and it's a commandment to work by the sweat. That, that's ridiculous. It also says that women, as a result, uh, Eve, uh, will now have to suffer intense pain in childbirth. No one says it's a prohibition. You can't get an epidural because of this comment. It also says, as a punishment in that story, that women will now have to subjugate their will to their husband. Who in 2019, which woman wants to stand up and say, yes, I believe that's a command from God. We must subjugate our will to our husband. None of those things were considered to be commandments. If you want to know why they were written and what you learned from it, you could read some of the commentaries on there, but no one considers them to be commandments. So these are the different issues that come up. 
The big thing is the brain death issue, and unfortunately, people watch too much Gray's Anatomy ER house, a good doctor, and they think they know what brain death is, and they have no idea. They always confuse it with coma or, or vegetative state, and that's not the same thing. Coma and vegetative state are the same thing. One is short-term, coma short-term, vegetative state is long-term. But brain death means when not just you're in a coma, but also the brain stem has died, and that means everything has died. And that's a completely different animal. Okay, so you've very eloquently laid out why people don't sign up and have the card and, and want to, to and want to donate organs. But there is a situation with the kidneys where people are alive and can donate organs So because you have two. So what's happening with that? So there's a huge movement, specifically among Orthodox Jews, both in America and in Israel, two great organizations, Renewal in America and Mandat Chaim in Israel. And they have succeeded in doing hundreds and hundreds of uh, living transplants where people just show up and say we want to altruistically donate our kidney and save the life of a stranger. Um, it's great. I mean, at, in America every year there's only 600 altruistic kidney donations. Uh, most of the living kidney donations are from father to son or daughter to father, whatever it might be. But purely altruistic, where you don't know the person, uh, there's 600. And out of the 600 in America, uh, 33% are Orthodox Jews, which is incredible, incredible, given the fact that Jews are only less than 2% of the population in America. So what people do is they also try to do a little bit of a leisure domain where they try to fool you and say, well, we're Jews, we're not really donating organs from cadavers, from beating heart cadavers, but we are from living, so we're contributing to society. Well, the truth is it's not so altruistic because those Orthodox Jews, by and large, donate to other Orthodox Jews. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I think it's great. And, and society does benefit indirectly because they're getting people off the list and mm-hmm. people move up the list. Uh, but it's not 100% altruistic because you're donating to your, your group. Um, and I think we need to step up to the plate. If we're going to take organs from beating heart cadavers, we should donate organs when we're beating heart cadavers. If you don't think that's death, then don't donate organs. Don't get an organ donor card, but don't take. You know, we had a terrible case here in Israel a few years ago where a 72-year-old woman was brain dead. A religious woman, a religious family, they asked, her to, they asked the family to donate her organs. There was a 52-year-old guy here in Israel who needed a lung transplant. They had the same blood type. The family said, we have to ask our rabbi. They went to the rabbi in B'nai Brak, and he said, no. Brain death with a beating heart is not dead. The heart's a sign of human life, always. So they said no. So what happened? The woman's heart stopped beating three days later. They buried her, and this 52-year-old man, or 56, I forget already, uh, he died about a month later. Didn't get a lung transplant. Now, that's a, that's a tragedy, but that's not a chilul Hashem. That's not a desecration of God's name. Where was the tragedy? A week later, an investigative journalist from Yidiot Chonot had discovered that this woman, three years prior, was dying of liver failure. And she asked Israel Transplant to get her a liver from a brain, a beating heart cadaver, and they did. So she took an organ from a brain-dead hmm. beating heart cadaver when she needed it, and her and her family took it, But when it came to donating, they said, no, our rabbi won't allow it. And that is hugely morally problematic. I mean, I see for you that this is actually your biggest problem right now, is that there's an inconsistency here, even somewhat of a hypocrisy, we could say, that you can take, but you cannot give. Um, And so it seems like the main group that you need to be working on then is the rabbis. No. No? Okay. The, first of all, we have hundreds of Orthodox rabbis that have our card. I don't need to get another 5, 10, 15, 20. That's not it. And this is going to sound strange, but my, my strategy is, is that um, the majority of Jews are not Orthodox, yet they think Orthodoxy doesn't allow for organization. So I signed up a few hundred rabbis. I made sure they had long beards. And I show pictures. We have brochures. When we get funding, we run out of these brochures very quickly. Um, but we get funding, and uh, we, 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 we produce, we, met, we, we go to press on these brochures. We, we distribute them around the world. I've lectured in uh, about 12 countries to more than 50,000 Jews over the 18-year period. And it's, and it's had an incredible impact where secular Jews will see rabbis with beards that have organ donor cards, and they'll donate organs. But Orthodox Jews are such a small percentage of Jews around the world. Like, I don't need to go ahead and get every last Orthodox Jew. There was a famous case here in Israel where a, a woman's son of a... a, a, a an Israeli soldier in the war in Gaza jumped into the tunnel and got a bullet in the head. And they pulled his body out. He was attached with a rope, pulled his body out. They uh, uh, ventilated him, brought him to the hospital in uh, Beersheba, 
and they were managed to keep his heart beating even though his brain was dead. They asked the family if they would donate his organs, not a religious family, and the family said, no, it's against Jewish law. The transplant coordinator from Israel Transplant pulled out the brochure from the Halachic Organ Donor Society, unfolded it, unfurled it, it's a long brochure, I'll, I'll show it to you, I have it here, um, and said, no, there are rabbis, plenty of rabbis that have organ donor cards, um, and they saw all those pictures, and they changed their mind, and they wow. donated his organs. Wow. They saved eight lives. Wow, so that's incredible, and that's wonderful yeah. that you were mm-hmm. so effective. Now, you said that Orthodox Jews, which seems like maybe you should just forget about the Orthodox Jews because they're more trouble than they're worth if it's not, if most of the people you can convince, and I'm speaking as someone who considers herself you know, part of that world uh, and has an organ donor card, incidentally, I should say that, and have for a very, very, very long time, and my kids know that as well. Skin, like whatever, I'm not going to need it. Um, but the, the question is, though... Um, do you have the right here to say where you want your organs to go? Ah, so I'll tell you something very interesting. Uh, Israel, like every other enlightened country, liberal democracy, does not allow you to say where the organs are going to go. When you're dead, you're dead, and the government decides on a needs basis who needs it. They do have something in America uh, called directed donation, that if you, someone is brain dead with a beating heart, and then they say, well, you don't want to donate. They say, well, I'll donate, but I have a cousin who needs a liver. I want them to get the liver. Mm-hmm. They'll allow you to donate one, to direct one organ to one person, but the rest goes to the generalist. In Israel, up until 2006, the number one form that was rejected by Israel Transplant, like people would fill out these forms and say, please send me an organ donor card. But some of these forms, people wrote stuff on them, conditions that couldn't be honored. So Israel Transplant rejected them. So the number up until 2006, the number one form that was rejected in Israel was, I want to donate my organs, but only if they don't go to Arabs. Because of the racism or the perception that every Arab, the mistaken perception that every Arab is a terrorist. Well, I've heard this from people. I don't want to save somebody who could potentially be a terrorist and kill Jews. I wouldn't want my family's, my father or whatever, his heart to go to do that. I've heard that people say that. I wouldn't want my organs to go to a Jew that kills Jews. And there are plenty of Jews in Israel that kill Jews. Okay, the numbers are obviously way different when it yes, comes I to that. There's probably, okay, there's probably statistically speaking, there's probably more Jews that kill Jews than Arabs that kill Jews. We have a country of nine million people, seven and a half million are Jews, one and a half million are Arabs. Okay, and we're not going to get into this discussion about terrorism, but you, I think, all my listeners understand where this is going. That. Okay. In a country where this is very much an issue, nobody right. wants to save a, te- a potential terrorist. And I, I'm not a, saying, a, 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 just saying that this has been an I issue. I respect someone say, I don't want to save a terrorist. Great. A potential terrorist? So a three-month-old baby who's, a, who's an Arab is also a potential terrorist? Well, I'm going to save a three-month-old And baby. that's the answer that I've also given to people is, you, first of all, you don't know what someone is going to grow up to be. And second of all, maybe the fact that you have saved a life in this Arab family will cause the family to think right. different. And maybe not. Maybe I'm being completely right. naive and maybe right. they just want to, you know, they still go by their job, but we don't know. Right. We just don't know. And, and because I'm also married to a physician, that, that can be an issue in anybody who's dealing in the medical world. Why should you have somebody come into the hospital as a Jewish doctor, as an Arab doctor, and save somebody who potentially is going to be against whatever your ideology is? You can't do that. Right. Hippocratic right. oath, you have to save lives, period. Right. But, but by the way, by the way, because of the demographics in Israel, out of the eight people that are going to receive an organ, there's nine million people in the country, seven and a half million are Jews, one and a half million are non-Jews, most of them are Arabs. So if you say no to organ donation because you're afraid you might save an Arab, that means you say, I'd rather let seven Jews die than save one Arab. Does that make any sense? And the reverse is true too, because when the Arab donates an organ, he also donates eight organs and seven go to Jews and one goes to an Arab. So even if you're like a very self-centered, prag- pragmatic individual, and you want to save more Jews than Arabs, you still will save more Jews if you donate organs. But what I wanted to say was, to continue that thought, um, <clears throat> excuse me, but to continue that thought, uh, in 2006, there was a point of inflection. And the number one form that was rejected by Israel Transplant, because the condition that was written on it was, I want to donate my organs, but only on the condition that it doesn't go to ultra-Orthodox Jews, the Haredim. Wow. So oh, my game, goodness. You want right. to start playing this game. This game has no, has no ending. Right. Yeah. I once had a woman call me up uh, from Florida, and she said she wanted to donate her kidney. Altro was sick to an Israeli. She didn't want to donate to anyone. She wanted, I said, great. She said, but I don't want to go to any Jew living in the West Bank. Only Tel Aviv, only West Jerusalem. I'm like, lady, I'm not going to play this game. 
Whoever needs it the most should get it. I don't care if they're Jew, Arab, Muslim, Christian, black, white, Chinese, whatever. I'm not going to play God. So you have your work cut out for you here. Now, I remember a few weeks ago, or it was already a couple of months ago, Rav Ettinger, uh, Viad Ettinger from the community of Ailey, father of 12, his kids were friends of my kids, um, was shot in a ter- by terrorists near Ariel, and the family donated his organs. And he was really an exceptional person, and, they, they, and a very orthodox rabbi had started yeshiva in Tel Aviv. And I believe that all, all his organs were donated, and that was in the news at the time as well. Yeah, I, I, I seem to remember that. Uh, I don't know it as well as you do, but I seem to remember that the family said that they wanted to donate his organs. I don't know if any organs were actually donated. Mm-hmm. It is very, and people don't seem to understand that only organs are taken from a person who happened to die in the hospital while they were on a ventilator, and then the brain died. Mm-hmm. Not a person who was killed on the street in a terrorist mm-hmm. attack or a car accident. Do you know how frequent it is for a person to die on a ventilator? No. Is, so people think, oh, if everyone signed an organ donor card, there'd be plenty of organs to go around. No. The answer is, out of all the, the people that die in Israel every year, in every country, it's 0.0024%. Very, very small. And that's why it's important that everyone gets an organ donor card, because we're so desperate to get any donation going on, uh, we have to sign up as many people as we can. Now, just a few weeks ago, I read a very interesting article, I'm sure you read it too, about uh, printing organs now. Yes. All right, so here we are in 2019, all kinds of crazy stuff happening in the world, where they're also doing experiments, let's say, on stem cells, right? At some point, you can be born, you could bank a little of the little pupic, you know, your umbilical cord blood. So everyone's got what they started right. from in a vial in some blood bank somewhere. And then if, God forbid, you lose an arm or your heart starts to go, or for some reason you need to regenerate your an organ of your own, you'll have the starter cells, the stem cells to do it. And then, of course, you have this whole thing of 3D printing and of possibly actually being able to print, which would mean that all this entire conversation and this entire issue is done, is dead, if you will. Right. Um, thoughts like that trouble me because every year 7,000 Americans die waiting for organs, 80 Israelis die waiting for organs, and I've been hearing this about 3D printing for about 15 years already. Uh, there has not been one successful case of 3D printing an organ that functions. Mm-hmm. Maybe it will be in the future. It looks like we're going in that direction. I hope it will happen. Until then, we should stop talking about it. Let the doctors, the researchers do what they need to do. Mm-hmm. When we get there, we'll all have a party and put myself out of business. I would love to close down the Halachic Organ Donor Society and say there's no longer a problem. We can just print whatever we want. Um, the only thing they've been able to, to 3D print, uh, and actually it wasn't 3D printing, I think it was, but it, they did grow, was a bladder. A bladder is not a functioning organ. A bladder is like a human tissue balloon that just fills with urine and empties of urine. It's not a functioning organ. They haven't been able to create anything. In fact, if you took a look carefully, and I watched it carefully on television the night they showed that 3D printed heart, mm-hmm. um, there was no blood in that heart. And yet the veins to the heart looked blue. Why? Because they used dye to show you where the vein is. It's very, <laughs> it's in the very early right. stages. Right. It looks really cool. There's told today there's not an, any artificially functioning organ that's made from human human cells. So tell us what the, what organs there are. Okay, so bladder isn't. So what are the usual, like, is, what's the you list or what's kidneys. the... Kidneys. I mean, the typical number that we have in the industry is eight, but it depends how you count it. Skin is an organ. It's the largest organ in the human body. You need that uh, for um, people who have burn victims. They need, they need that to prevent uh, infection. So skin, two kidneys, liver could be cut in half because the liver grows back. Lungs, uh, have, you have five lobes of your lung. They could be also separated. Pancreas, uh, inge- corneas. Uh, cornea is interesting because we said before that you're allowed to violate Jewish law uh, to save a life. Okay, so then can you donate your corneas? Because the person's not going to die if he doesn't get corneas. He just won't see. So what happened was the, the chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Unterman, in the 60s, he wanted to somehow make society a better place. He created a legal fiction using Talmudic law to say that since the Talmud says that blindness is akin to death, right? Because don't forget in those days, if you were blind, you couldn't chop wood, you couldn't sell wood, you couldn't get food, there was no social security, you couldn't function. Um, And don't forget also today, even today, people who are blind die at an earlier average age because of accidents and depression. So there is something that you're extending someone's life. And he basically said that let's create a legal fiction since the Talmud uh, the, the tractate Nadarim 
uh, page 60, folio B, says that a person who's blind is as if they are dead. Therefore, we'll say we can donate corneas because if you donate a cornea, you're saving a person from blindness, which is saving him from death. He did say, though, that you can only donate one cornea to one person because once you give him sight in one eye, he's no longer under the category of a blind person. You know, very, these legal fictions are common where the rabbis are trying to help us function in modern-day society. That's why over this last Pesach, you and I had things in our house mm-hmm. that we shouldn't have had, but we, quote-unquote, sold it to a non-Jew. The non-Jew doesn't know where I live. He doesn't have a key to my house. He never picks up the stuff, and magically, right after mm-hmm. the Passover is over, he sells it back to me. So it's kind of a legal fiction to help, society, help us function in modern society. Okay. So you're about to head out for a month abroad. Uh, to talk about the halacha. Uh, a, could you give my listeners a way of finding out where you're going to be in case this has piqued their interest? And also, are you? is it just for Jews? Or can Christians come also? A lot of my listeners, a lot of the people that I guide here, um, and some I think of the most interesting things going on in not just the United States, but in the Western world right now, is Christians coming closer to the Bible, understanding the relevance of the Bible? And perhaps this is something within their communities now that they weren't so aware of. I mean, if they were, you know, if uh, we had a lot of Christians giving donors, that would also fill fill in right. a lot of the gaps. So is, is that part of your intended audience, or you're just working towards getting Jews to understand that this is not against halacha? Right. So I actually happen to be very racist. I only allow human beings to come to my lectures. So if you're a human being, you can come. If you're not a human being, you can come. Uh, also concerning donating organs, I'm very racist as well. The organs must go only to human beings. I will not allow them to go to non-human beings. That's where I stand. I'll be lecturing and more than happy. I've lectured in, I've done grand rounds in hospitals. I've done, I've lectured in the Christian school in East Jerusalem, uh, the Schmidt school. All of them were Christians and Muslims. They were not Jews. I'm more than happy for everyone to learn, if they want to learn what Talmudic law, what Halakha, Jewish law says about organ donation and brain death. I'm lecturing in uh, Englewood, Ahava Torah, on June 2nd, uh, formerly Rabbi Golden Shul. Uh, I'm lecturing in uh, uh, June, I think, 15th or about, maybe June 18th, in the Hamptons out in Long Island. Um, and I'm going, very excited this week, I'm going down. I was invited, because we have saved so many lives in Israel, uh, the ambassador, the Israeli ambassador to Washington, uh, Ambassador Ron Dermer, has been gracious enough to invite me to their Yom HaTzimut, their Independence Day party they're having this week in, in, in the embassy oh. in Washington. So I'm going there. I'll be there for the party on Wednesday. Do you have extra dates open if somebody was in touch with you and said, listen, you know, you're not, you're not uh, scheduled to come to my community. I don't know. They're in Chicago, wherever they are. But this sounds like something that I think I can get a few people together for. Do you have some open dates? Sure. I have a lot of dates that are open, absolutely. And if you're interested in uh, getting a, a part-time job in public relations, I'm more than happy to hire you because <laughs> you're doing a very, you're doing a better job than I am. But yes, I'm open to uh, any dates. So just give me a call. Robbie Berman at Hodes.org, R-O-B-B-Y-B-E-R-M-A-N at H-O-D-S.org. That stands for Halachic Organ Donor Society.org. Okay, and there's a website, I assume, that explains yeah, all this as Hodes, well? Hodes.org. It's a very robust website with dozens and dozens of videos from rabbis and doctors explaining brain death from a medical perspective, from a halakha perspective, uh, many, many articles. But we have a lot of articles on our website that are against organ donation and against brain death because I really believe that the truth will win out and I'm not trying to hide anything from anyone. So feel free if you want to get some information against organ donation, you can read it on our site as well. Mm-hmm. Is one of the concerns about people accepting it. Let's talk about that. Do you ever have concerns from people accepting it? Because you do have, let's say, AIDS or, you know, or um, hepatitis. And with donating an organ, I would imagine would come whatever disease pack the person who died had with them. And then you could have that issue as well. Does that, so we've been talking about the donor part, but how about the recipient side of it? So that's a great question. There, there have been cases where people have contracted cancer, uh, AIDS from donations it's very, very rare. The doctors do a very good job. Technology has gotten very, very good in trying to determine what the, what, what the person has or doesn't have. It used to be if you want to know if you had AIDS, you had to wait for six months before you could determine. Now they have tests much, much quicker. Um, it's a, it, it is a risk, but it's a very, very small risk. And assuming if someone's on a donor list, their risk of dying is pretty high from because their liver is failing or whatever. So I would imagine that people aren't going to get overly choosy. Obviously, you don't right. want it to get something disease implanted in you along with your new liver. By the way, there are people who are so desperate to get an organ because they know they're about to die. Mm -hmm. They do take organs that are called extended criteria, which means it's not the normal criteria, but the organ doesn't look good. It's not perfect. The person had cancer. The person has HIV. You can't, there's no substitute for liver. You have 
dialysis for a kidney, but not for a liver. So if your liver is failing and your doctors think you're going to die within a week, there are people who take livers from a HIV patient because people don't die from HIV anymore. It doesn't blow up right. into, into AIDS. Uh, they just take the cocktail and they live with HIV. It's not ideal. They don't want it. They'd prefer not to, but they prefer that over death. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. It does not sound ideal, but right. uh, it's definitely better. At least, at least you're alive. And I would imagine, let's say, skin you know, even if somebody died of a disease, I mean, I'm assuming the skin, which is the big organ, like you said, especially for people with terrible burns, um, you could still, you know, still take somebody's skin. Yeah, I don't know how if, if disease transfers through skin because I think the way it works is when you get burned over the majority of your body, they put the skin transplant on. It's not really transplant; it just covers your body to make sure you don't get an infection. And then when when your body is strong enough to grow its own skin back, the transplanted, the quote unquote transplanted skin sloughs off. Mm-hmm. So it just protects you for a certain period of time, and then you grow your own skin. So it might be that it doesn't transfer any kind of any of those diseases. When you started this 18 years ago, did you know how difficult this was going to be? Uh, I did not know how difficult it was going to be. I had projected, I remember my first board meeting, I said, I think I can solve this problem between uh, three and five years, and my board laughed at me. Uh, also, I tell you the problem, I'm not a professional fundraiser, and yet I raise the money for the organization. Um, it, it, r- r- fundraising is an awful, awful I, I, don't, I, I, I hate it with a passion. And I really thought that it was difficult in the very beginning because I was trying to sell a dream. I was trying to sell a vision of what I could do, that I could cause a sea change among Jews and get them to all of a sudden understand that the, there's major halakha support for organization. So I thought it's hard to sell a dream. But after a couple of years, when we started saving lives, when people started donating organs, because of the halakhic organ donor study, I thought the money would just come pouring in. And unfortunately, it just hasn't happened. So every year we struggle to make ends meet. Um, yes. The money goes towards what? Towards the in- education? And we have a staff and the brochures and look at the website and the video production, uh, advertisements. It's, uh, right now we have a great program going on where we're paying six college students throughout uh, America to become uh, advocates for organ donation with this large Jewish presence on their college campus and they have to do a whole set of things that we train them to do their year and they're getting a two thousand dollar grant uh by the way you can still apply for this grant till the end of june uh if you know someone who's in a very big uh, population of jewish students on their college campus we give you two thousand dollars you can use the money to pay for your tuition to buy food to do whatever you want go out to restaurants it's your money uh but you have to do things you have to organize two lectures during the year one with a transplant surgeon one with a rabbi you, know, you need to write an article or encourage the student newspaper to write an article about organ donation and Jewish law. We have a whole list of things to do, but that's an, we call it the HAP program, H-A-P, the HODES Ambassador Program. If you're interested in being an ambassador, being an activist on campus, please contact us and we'll send you the application. Okay, so, so the fundraising is towards the educational aspect. You're not paying for the transplants. Every country or every people have their own insurance, right. and if, they, if the transplants happen, that, that's a completely other... Excuse the ridiculous. It's not even a joke. Completely other organ of of services. That's or yeah, yeah. We we don't we don't get involved in the actual transplants. We're educational. We're awareness. We we try to help people make the right decision and let them know there's great halachic support for the decision of donating organs. But we don't actually go into the hospital. People call me up mm-hmm. all the time and say, "I need a kidney. I need a heart. I need a lung. Can you help me?" Unfortunately, I can't. Right. Okay, Robbie Berman. Anything else? Um, this was tremendously informative to me. Um, no, I thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay. And uh, again, I was very happy that you were able to immediately um, alight upon the reason, which I also think is why not cutting into a dead body has become a taboo when violating every other commandment, people all get right away, uh, oh, I can eat pork if to right. save a life. I can drive on the Sabbath. But why did this become a taboo? Because no one could ever, for 3,300 years, no one could ever imagine that cutting into a corpse. By the way, don't forget also that when the Torah was written, not desecrating a dead body. In those days, desecration was what Daesh does, ISIS, ISIL, right? They kill someone, they cut off the head, they play soccer with the head. Disgusting. That's desecrating a dead body. But rabbis don't view donating organs as desecration. Desecrating means your, your purpose, your intention is to really denigrate the dead body. Uh, there was a rabbi, a famous Moroccan rabbi. This is wild. People never heard of this. He was a famous Moroccan rabbi. Chief Rabbi Haifa died in 1973. He had ruled that Jews could even donate their bodies to science. Really? Not even to save a life, but just to science. Why? He said, that's not desecrating a dead body when they cut it up. He said, your intention is to improve medicine. He said, why is donating your body to science more of a desecration than letting, putting it in the ground and letting worms or microbes eat the body? 
So he was all for it, but people don't hear that. People don't know it. People think Jews can never get autopsies. It's not true at all. If, if by doing an autopsy, you most likely can save a life, then you can do the autopsy. That's the way the rabbis rule. But people don't know that. Mm-hmm. So I have this friend who studied medicine in Italy, and they learned gross anatomy with plastic cadavers because Italy is a Catholic country uh-huh. and doesn't allow uh, to do it on real cadavers. What kind of position uh, is your husband? He, internal medicine. Internal medicine. So something that just occurred to me, because you mentioned the rabbi from Morocco, do you see a difference in the rulings between rabbis of, you know, the Middle Eastern rabbis yes. with the misnamed Sephardi rabbis, the Mizrahi rabbis, but the rabbis who lived more and ruled more in a Muslim-oriented world, shall we say, yes. versus Ashkenazi rabbis, the rabbis who were much more influenced living in Ashkenaz right. and living more in a Christian world? Well, first you should know the chief rabbi of Israel always has two rabbis, chief rabbi Sephardi, chief rabbi Ashkenazi. Every single chief rabbi for the past 30 years has said brain death is death and we should donate organs unilaterally. Yep, both. In general, the Sephardic leadership, the Sephardic rabbinic leadership have all said that brain death is death and Jews should donate organs. That's Rav Amar, Rav Vad Yosef, Rav Mordechai Yahu. Um, in the Ashkenazi world, there's a, there are great Ashkenazi posts that also say brain death is death. Rav Moshe Feinstein, Rav Zameh Chema Goldberg, Rav David Feinstein, um, <clears throat> Rav Avram Shapiro, but there are also great gedolim that don't, uh, great rabbinic leaders such as Rav Shach and Rav Yashiv. They say no, and because you have a lot of Ashkenazi rabbis that will in no way, shape, or form uh, break from the position of Rav Shach and Rav Yashiv, they say no, we can't, you know, brain death is not death, you can't donate organs. Mm-hmm. So it could be that a new generation of rabbis, because this amazing, wonderful generation of rabbis, really uh, incredibly brilliant men who kept Torah alive in Europe for so many years, Many of them are now dying, that generation. They're in their 90s, they're in their 100s. These are the survivors of the Holocaust who really rebuilt the Torah life in Israel and in other places in the world. And it could be that some of the newer generation will maybe a little, you know, understand medicine a little differently, understand the world a little differently, are living in Israel and not necessarily in Europe anymore, um, will, you know, come around and, uh, and you know, see what, what it is that you've been saying. Right. Inshallah. <laughs> with the help of God, inshallah. Yes, with the help of God. And the main thing is, of course, that we should all be healthy and never need an organ donation. So if you're smoking, put the cigarette down right now. No more. Okay? But, yeah, but things happen and people do get sick and people are born with, you yeah, know, I something. Yeah, your readers, your readers, your listeners, uh, just to think about one thing. Everyone who's listening, um, think about it seriously. If you were dying and you needed an organ or your father or brother or sister or child was needing an organ, and there was someone in the hospital who had a child that was brain dead with a beating heart that would, heart, that would stop beating in a few days. And they were having issues that they didn't want to donate. What would you want me to say to them? What would you want me to say to them? Well, what you would want me to say to them, say to yourself. Because you know you would take an organ and you would beg to get one. So think about other people. I know at the moment of death, it's very traumatic and very emotionally challenging and people kind of just become very defensive and think only about themselves. But it is at that very moment when you shouldn't just think about yourself, think about other people. And when you do that, it makes you feel a little bit better. And I also want to take that decision out of my children's hands, that if something's happening to me, I don't want the, someone to come up to them and say, well, can you know you donate her organs? Because they're probably not concentrating on the you know things at the moment. That's why I have my card signed. They know that that is what I want to have to have you know happen. And uh, there's no decision for them to make. I've made that decision, and I just want it to be carried out. And I think that just like we make wills, or we want to make sure that the kids don't fight about the inheritance, and we shouldn't, right? And well, we want to lay it all out. We should do this as let well. Let me tell you the difference between Israel and America. In America. Organ donor cards are actually legal, legally binding documents, and they will fight if you if you signed a card and you are brain dead with a beating heart, and the family says we don't feel comfortable with organ donation. They will go to court and try to remove the organs, regardless of the family. But in Israel, even if you have an organ donor card, if someone in the immediate family says no, don't do it. They won't do it. Wow. So okay. Need I need to have the conversation That's with what all of them. In the industry, you have to have the conversation, and what a wonderful way to actually have a meaningful conversation with your family about your values by caring about other people. Um, you know, Ramosha Feinstein said, uh, yes, donating organs is emotionally a very difficult thing to do. You cut up my father to save the lives of strangers? He said, but that's the mitzvah. That's the good deed. 
you're doing something which emotionally is difficult to do, but you're doing it because it's the right thing to do. That's the mitzvah. That's the good deed that you're about to embark upon. And, what, and as Rabbi Riskin said, what's a better way to go to the pearly gates when you, upon your death? Say, Rabbi, I just saved eight, Rabbi, God, I just saved eight lives. Well, it's the same thing as planting a tree whose fruit you may never eat. And there's some things that you just do in this world and you do it for the future. Not necessarily for people you're going to know either. And that's really the legacy that we all leave behind. So thank you, Robbie Berman, for a very, very interesting discussion. And I hope that uh, you get people coming and, and you're able to you know, have people make intelligent decisions, um, but also based on halacha, which is important to so many of us. We don't want to do things despite what our leaders say. We would like to do things because what the leaders say and feel that it fits in beautifully with the really the overriding messages of Judaism, which, as you said at the very beginning, saving a life takes precedence over virtually everything else. Right. Thank you very much for interviewing me and making this an important issue to share the information with people. Thank you. Okay. All right, everybody. Uh, I would say, like, I hope you enjoyed this show. I don't know if enjoying is the word, but I hope you found it informative and, uh, and perhaps rethinking some of you know, the ideas that you had because this really is a very, very important issue. And as Robbie said, you know, if you're in that situation and you need the, the, the organ, you know, you would like people it, it to be available for you as well. Okay, Shalom Eida. We should never need it uh, from either side. Okay, Eve Harrow, Rejuvenation on the Land of Israel Network. Um, take care, everybody. You can always be in touch. You can always check my website for what I'm doing and, and about to do. And next week, I think I'll finally, like, sit down and fill you guys all in on my last very interesting month, including a side trip to Saloniki last week. But that will have to wait until next week. So take care, everyone. Eve Harrow, Rejuvenation on the Land of Israel Network. Goodbye for now. Hi, everybody. Eve Harrow, host of Rejuvenation. Join us on the Land of Israel Network for the Shavuot of a Lifetime, where I will be giving a special class that weekend and guiding Herodian on Monday as the bus goes out to the farm. So join us for the Shavuot of a Lifetime in just a few weeks, Thursday through Monday, June 6th through 10th, 2019, at the Jerusalem